good morning, Harrison Bridge. Hope you guys are having an amazing weekend. I know we have. Uh, we are a full swing in all things Christmas. As Elise mentioned earlier, so many opportunities, so many things to do, so many people to gather with. We just had our Connect Group Christmas party last night, an amazing time. Shameless plug here. If you do not have a Connect Group, let me highly encourage you. Uh, today, we're not even talking about Connect Groups, but uh, these are, this is an intentional community I would highly encourage you to be a part of. If it's your first Sunday, first few Sundays with us, you say, one the world's Connect Group? It's really a small group. Uh, but let me tell you this, even in, I told our group last night, even in the two almost now, three months that our group has existed, uh, we've seen just the Lord move and, and work in many different ways there. And it's so cool last night reflecting on that. So encourage you with that. Also encourage you, uh, the event tonight, uh, the worship night there, uh, Melody and I will be there. Look forward to seeing some of you guys there. It'll be a, a special, special night. As we continue today with our ordinance series, uh, we want to take just a moment and reflect upon last Sunday and uh, baptism as an ordinance. And we'll talk about what ordinances are if you say, what in the world is that? But we talked a lot about baptism last week. And I'll tell you, across all campuses, maybe if you didn't see it, it's, it's still being shared all across social media. Seems like every time I sign on social media, there's a different news outlet that's picking up the story about what God did here last week. We saw 141 people uh, go through the baptismal waters last week. The, out of those, we had about 85, I think, scheduled, which meant that we had conversations conversations beforehand. So it meant somewhere around 60 people, close to 60 people, responded spontaneously to baptism last Sunday across all of our campuses. Truly a special day, truly a historic day for our church. I don't think we've ever had a day like that before. And so we're still celebrating. And here's the main reason why I mentioned that. Not to say, oh, we had 141 baptisms. Look at us. That's not it at all. But it's simply to say, I believe that there were people sitting in this room last week that for whatever reason, you felt the need to respond, but for whatever reason, you didn't. And so let me challenge you because the temptation now is to think that, oh, I missed my opportunity. Oh, I, I, I'm not going to have that moment again. We offer that moment. We offer that opportunity almost every single month. And so January 15th, February 11th are the next two weekends that we will offer this. And my challenge to you is simply this, that if you have trusted in Jesus, maybe you trusted in Jesus for the first time last week, or maybe you've never been baptized in terms of believer's baptism, as we talked about, that you would be challenged here in this moment to take that next step. Because the temptation is to think that, oh, well, God just moves like that on special Sundays like that. And he's not moving now. Actually, he is. He's moving all days. And so our encouragement, our challenge is, if you are in need of believer's baptism, that you would start that conversation today, that you would fill out that form. You can find it online. If you're on your uh, phone, as soon as you go to our church website, it's one of the first buttons up there. Fill out that form. I'll reach out this week, and we'll start that conversation and help you uh, take that next step of believer's baptism there as I said, though, we're continuing our ordinances series today as we focus in on what we call the Lord's Supper. Now, real quick about ordinances, it's a word that we don't necessarily use a lot. I mentioned this last week. So you may be sitting there saying, what in the world are ordinances? Like, I, it's my first Sunday here. I, I don't even know what that word means. That's, that's okay. It, I, it's not a word I use that often I, anyways in my own life. I didn't wake up this morning and look at Melody and say, hey, we're going to observe the ordinances today, right? She looked at me weird and I'm like, okay, like what is that? So ordinances, as we said last week and just bears repeating here, ordinances are a symbol that point us back towards a pivotal event, just to put it in a very generic way. As we're talking about ordinance here this morning of Lord's Supper, it is a symbol as we'll take a bread symbolically and a cup symbolically in a little while. These are two uh, parts of this symbolic Lord's Supper that point us back to the sacrificial death of Jesus. And it's a highly important, highly impactful time for us here as we reflect upon this symbol. And here's what we find with ordinances, really, as we're saying here this morning, symbols. That symbols are not just meant to be, oh, cool, we observe the Lord's Supper because we're supposed to, and that's our tradition, because my mama and then my grandmama and great-grandmama, they did it, so we should do it. But there's actually meaning behind it. And it's a meaning to call us back to reflect upon what's happened. It's a call to reflect upon how it should impact me now. And it's a call to look forward. And here's a real you know, practical example of that. I grew up in Johnsonville, South Carolina. Went to Johnsonville High School, the pride of the PD. Johnsonville flashes football. I was on that team. And every 
day that I walked in my high school gymnasium, I was confronted with symbols. And those symbols were our sports uh, championship banners. And so when I walked in my high school gymnasium, I saw Johnsonville Flashes state champs 1993 football. I saw Johnsonville Flashes lower state champs 1996 football, 1998 lower state champs. And so what this meant for me in the early 2000s, when I walked in that gym, it wasn't just, oh, there's some cool banners up there, but those banners served a purpose because it was meant to remind me of the history of our football program. It was meant to encourage me and challenge me to be a good part of that program. And it was meant to call me to leave a legacy for those who would follow behind. And these are what symbols are for. And today, in a much more meaningful sense, we look at the Lord's Supper. And the question we're asking here today is, what exactly are we remembering? Because we said it may be your first Sunday, first few Sundays with us. And you're like, you're going to take a bread and cup. And what in the world does this exactly mean? There's some weird stuff here. We're going to unpack it and we're going to answer this question. What are we remembering today? What does it mean to observe the Lord's Supper? And we'll answer it in three ways as we'll unpack in just a moment. But if you've got a Bible, you can uh, flip to Matthew 26. We'll be reading verses 26 through 29. They'll also be up on the screen. So no worries if you don't have it in front of you. The backdrop to this passage is that Jesus is mere hours away from crucifixion. That is, he is mere hours away from being nailed to a cross, from shedding his blood, from dying a horrific event, and to being the once and for all sacrifice for people who were openly hostile to him. But now where we find ourselves at the moment in Matthew 26 is they're enjoying what in the followers' minds would be the Passover meal. And we'll, we'll unpack that in just a moment as well. And so on this night, the last night of his life, they had met together up in this room. They're reclining on couches, as would have been the case in a U-shape. And they are partaking of the Passover meal. And in the middle of this meal, Jesus will point to this Passover meal from the Old Testament times, and he'll say, here is the new meaning. Here's what it means now. And it will be what we call the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so look with me, Matthew 26, verse 26. Matthew writes, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so here, as we find, maybe you'll see it in your chapter heading there, institution of the Lord's Supper. And as we said, we're answering this question, what, are we, what exactly are we remembering here with this ordinance? Well, three things that we find that we are remembering here. And the first is this. We are remembering what he did for us. And this is the biggest part of the Lord's Supper because it is a pointing back to our Savior dying on a cross for us. If you had to sum it up and say, Corey, what exactly is the Lord's Supper about? It is us as a people, believers, taking a, an intentional moment within the church congregation to look back upon the finished work of the cross of Jesus. That's the bare bones answer there for you. But we're going to unpack this a little more. We're going to wade through it a little more. You see, on this night, even before we, we get to talking about the cross, it's a significant night. Because the backdrop of this is that Jesus and his followers, Jewish people, would have been thinking not, his followers wouldn't have been thinking about a cross that was to come. You read later on in the Gospels, they're, they're having a hard time making sense of this moment in a lot of ways. But actually, they're thinking back to the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible in the Old Testament there. And if you go home today and you read the opening chapters of Exodus, what you find are God's people and they are sitting in slavery. They've been sitting in slavery for 400 years. They are under the oppressive thumb of, of Pharaoh and Egypt, the mightiest nation on the face of the earth at this time. And they've been crying out for 400 years for God to do something, for circumstances to change, for a savior to be given. And it seems like from their end, there's just complete radio silence. Now, we know from our end that God is always working, even when we can't see it. And God has been working. And in as Exodus opens up, we find that he raises up one to lead them out, Moses. And so Moses is commissioned by God. He is called by God to go before the most powerful man in the world at that time, Pharaoh, 
and to declare that Pharaoh has to let God's people go. Now, this is a, uh, a one, not just a one-time moment. It's actually a series of events where Moses will go to Pharaoh and he will say, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh will reply, no, not going to do it. Who are you? And so then a series of events will take place, what we know as the 10 plagues. And these 10 plagues are meant to showcase the power of God and show he has no rival. There is no quasi-demigod called Pharaoh in Egypt that can rival the God of the Bible. And what we find is it slowly amps up plague after plague until we get to the 10th plague, what we know as the plague of the firstborn. And what happens here is that God says to Pharaoh one last time, he says, through Moses, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. And he says, okay. And so then he gives his people instructions. He says, on this particular night, the death angel is going to come forth and he's going to kill the firstborn of every household that does not obey my commandments. You say, what are the commandments? Well, to summarize them here for us, the commandments that God gave to his people, really to anybody that would listen at this time in, in Egypt, he said, you find a perfect spotless lamb, you slaughter it, and you take the blood and you wipe it over the door sill. And then you eat of the lamb. And you're, they're told to eat in haste. Why? Because they were to eat expecting that God would deliver them, and he would. And you see, the blood smeared over the door sill would signal to the death angel that was coming that that death angel was to pass over that house. Now, later on, as this night would happen, and it was a horrific event for those who didn't listen to the commands of God, Pharaoh would tell the people to get out and to go with haste. And they would cross the Red Sea. God would split the Red Sea, and they would find themselves at Mount Sinai. And God would give the law through Moses, and he would establish the Mosaic Covenant. That is, he would covenant with his people and would call them his people. And this covenant defines the rest of the Old Testament. If you are to understand the Old Testament, you have to understand the events that take place in Exodus and then later on in Deuteronomy as well. And so as this is taking place, God calls his people throughout the Old Testament and beyond to remember this night of deliverance. When God passed over in judgment the people that had listened to his words and commands. And in fact, the Passover is one of three festivals or events, if you will, in the Jewish life that the people were called to make a pilgrimage to the Jerusalem city there to observe. And so this is what Jesus and his disciples were doing. It's a highly important festival in the Jewish lifestyle. So in their minds on this night, they are celebrating the deliverance of God and the night of the Passover meal. So this is the backdrop. But as you find here in Matthew 26, Jesus says, while we're celebrating this, Actually, there's a new meaning for it here and now. And what Jesus is pointing towards here as we talk about what he did is he's not saying, okay, well, tomorrow will come. I'll be crucified on the cross and you guys have still got to slaughter some lambs to cover your sins temporarily. Because what the Bible says is that you and I are separated from God because of our sins. And that the only way to take care of that is by the shedding of blood. The remission of sins only happens by the shedding of blood. And so what we find from the book of Exodus all the way up until this point that the people year after year are having to slaughter animal after animal to pay a temporary price to have their sins temporarily forgiven. But it's not a sufficient sacrifice in terms of a permanent state. And what Jesus says on this night is, I am the better sacrifice. I am the better Passover lamb. I am the sinless sacrifice. As the author of Hebrews says, I am the once and for all sacrifice. And that is in a few hours, Jesus will be on the cross shedding his blood, his body being broken so that I don't have to worry in the year 2023 about slaughtering a lamb to pay for my sins because the lamb has already been slain. The blood has already been shed. And so when we summarize, what did Jesus do? What are we remembering in terms of those terms there? What Jesus did for us was willingly sacrifice himself for people who were enemies of God so that we might know God. That he would willingly go to a cross in mere hours from this moment we just read so that we may have a way out there. And it leads us to the second point here as we answer this question. What are we remembering? Well, we remember what he did on a bloody cross. Secondly, we remember who we are in him. 
You see, a lot of times we, we, we treat the, the Lord's Supper and maybe even our salvation as, okay, yes, Jesus has saved me because he has died for me on the cross. He has shed his blood. I am forgiven of sins. And we, we kind of set it aside. But what we see here, and especially as we talk about symbols and ordinances here, that they're not just something to look back on as a past finished event, but they're meant to change us here and now. It's meant to have a present impact on you and on me. And what we mean by that is Jesus shedding his blood for us, us turning to Jesus in faith is not just a one-time event, but it is a continuous thing that impacts us day after day after day. And what do we mean by this? Well, under the old covenant, the covenant that was given at Mount Sinai there, as we said, the people would be called to shed the blood of animals to cover their sins temporarily. So it was always this reoccurring event, if you will. It was never enough to fully satisfy the wrath of God that was due for their sins. And so always, always, you had to worry about offering the right sacrifices in the right way. And it was just, you know, I, I can't even imagine waking up in the morning and be like, okay, I got to offer the sacrifice because I messed up yesterday. And it, how exhausting that would be. But yet what we find in the New Testament is actually a new covenant that is offered. And Jesus makes mention of this in the latter part of the passage we read. And it's actually a covenant that has been hinted at, that has been pointed to by the prophet Jeremiah hundreds of years before this night. And Jeremiah writes about a new covenant that is to be brought about by the sprinkling of blood on our hearts. Because you see, the old covenant dealt outwardly with our actions, right? In the Old Testament, when we disobeyed, when the people disobeyed, it dealt outwardly, but there was no heart change, so the people kept disobeying. They kept not longing for God. But the new covenant inaugurates a new heart. Why? Because it is sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus. And what does this mean? God has dealt once and for all with the people who have trusted Jesus. God has dealt once and for all with our wayward hearts, where the source of our sin begins. And what this means is now... I do not have to wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning on December 11th, 2023, and worry, oh no, am I good enough for God, or have I done enough for God, or did I mess up yesterday too much for God? Has God withdrawn his love for me? But no, I'm reminded from the Old Testament that God's mercies are new every single morning. That therefore there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That I stand not as an enemy of God, but I stand as a son of God. God has looked upon us as enemies and offered us a way to be adopted into the family of God, to be called sons and daughters, to experience the full unconditional love of him. So who are we in light of this symbol here? If I know Jesus, I am a redeemed son of God, not because of anything I've done, but because of the shed blood and the finished work of him upon that cross. This is how it impacts us here and now, that I am free from sin. Though I may struggle with sin still, I am free to walk away from that sin because of the power of Jesus that has changed my life. I can wake up every morning knowing that God is for me, that God loves me, and I don't have to earn it, but I can live from the foundation of it there. And it leads us to the third thing we see as we answer this question. What are we remembering? We saw what he did. Secondly, who we are in him. And third, where our hope is. Now, out of all the three points, I don't have to spend a lot of time up here convincing you that we need hope in this world. You don't need me to stand up here for 32 minutes on a Sunday and to tell you why we need hope. You know personally, whether you know Jesus or not, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, that we need hope in this world. Our world is full of discouragement. Our world is full of hopeless times and places and situations. Even when things are going well, it seems that somehow this world finds a way to bring us down in hopeless moments, in hopeless pits here. And so even if we've been changed by the blood of Jesus, if we've been saved by the blood of Jesus, there are still many of us in here that sit in discouragement. And I'll give you a real practical example. It literally just happened last week. We came off that historic day, 141 people baptized, just celebrating. And literally my phone, this text rolls through Sunday afternoon. Previously where I served as student pastor, a girl who was in our student ministry took her own life, ninth grade girl. And so here I am on the mountaintop walking out of these doors, and then three hours later, I'm being confronted with the hopeless situation there. And it, it left me asking, Lord, why? 
You know, the questions that don't really have an answer. And even though I had just been preaching about the hope of Jesus, I was reminded of the hopelessness that abounds in our world. We are a people that are not short on discouragement, but are short on encouragement. And this is why Jesus says at the end of his, this passage we read, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you and my father's kingdom. This points towards the hope that we have in him. And what does this mean? Jesus is pointing towards the marriage supper of the lamb. When all things will be made new, when every tear will be wiped away, when every broken thing will be fixed. And those who have trusted in Jesus, though we sit in despair in this world, we know that our hope will be realized. This is the hope we have in him, that we can face situations like the text rolling through for me last week and say, I have no answers for this, but I know a God who is going to put it all back in place. I know a God who is going to fix this. So that even in the moment, even in the pits of hurt and despair and discouragement, I can see a way through, not because I'm strong enough or smart enough, but because of the Jesus who has paid the price to show me the way through. We have hope in Jesus if we are a people of Jesus. And so while we remember and look back upon the finished work at the cross, and while we see how it should change us as a people of his, it calls us to a hope of a day that's coming when everything will be made new. This is the hope that we are called to here. So with two groups sitting in here, I understand we'll have two groups sitting in here. One are those who do not know Jesus. Maybe you feel out of place in this moment. You say, oh no, I came on the wrong Sunday. It's the Lord's Supper. What in the world is this? Trust me, you are in the right place. You are exactly where you need to be. My encouragement to you, my challenge to you, my ask of you would simply be this. That you would hear about a God who looks upon the enemies of his and invites them to be sons and daughters. That you would look at the world as we just talked about that offers discouragement and hopeless pits and valleys. And you will see a God who can lead you out of that. That can promise hope that is as sure as the foundation that we stand on. And if that's you who do not know Jesus, my invitation is simply this. That you will reflect upon a God who would die for a people who would be hostile to him so that you could be made right with him. You say, well, how do I respond? It's the question we asked last week of baptism. Acts 2, Peter preaches a sermon about Jesus, about this gospel. And the people say, I'm, I'm moved. I, I need to respond. How do I respond? And what the Bible says that Peter responds is repent and be baptized. What does this mean? To summarize it very quickly for you. Turn from your sins and turn to the Jesus that has shed his blood for you, that offers forgiveness to you. And then follow with believer's baptism. Another ask we would have of this group is that you withhold from participating in the Lord's Supper. This is a, an ordinance that is meant for believers. It's not to ostracize you or exclude you or make you feel bad. Nobody's going to look at you any sideways way. But it's simply meant to be for the people who have laid hold of the hope that Jesus offers. Again, we would encourage you to observe this moment that you would reflect upon this Jesus. And my hope and prayer would be that you would trust this Jesus before you leave here today. For those of us in here today who have trusted Jesus, in just a moment, I'm going to pray and the band's going to come up. And when they come up, we're going to pass around the first part of the elements, the bread. And we'll read a passage after the song and we'll take the bread together. So when you grab the bread, know that, hold on to it, and we'll take it together there. But what does the bread mean? To put it simply, we've outlined a lot of it here and walking through these three points, but to summarize it here for us today, the bread is symbolic of the body that was broken for you and for me. It was the high cost, the sacrifice that was needed so that a people who were hostile and hopeless could be called sons and daughters because of the broken body of Jesus, because of the sinless sacrifice for us here today. And so in just a second, I'll pray. The band will be up here as we finish praying. We'll pass the elements, hold on to those, and we'll take it after the song. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you, you are a God who changes lives. You're a God who offers yourself up as a sacrifice for those of us who did not want anything to do with you. 
And yet you still died a horrific death, a bloody death, a crucified death. So that we might be adopted into the family of God. Lord, let us not lose sight. Let us not take for granted how deep, how wide, how big that love, that mercy from our God is. As we prepare, prepare to take the bread, Lord, and we prepare our hearts, may we see the high cost of our sin. May we see a Savior who was willing to sacrifice himself so that we might know you. And may we respond accordingly here and now. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I wanted to take a few moments and to talk about the next part of the Lord's Supper, the next element, if you will, the cup that is representative of the blood of Jesus. And it's easy for me to understand in, in my pragmatic mind what the bread represents, right? The tangible breaking of the body, but the blood, what exactly can we put our fingers on and say, that's what the blood is. This is what the blood represents. And Jesus makes it clear in this passage here that the cup, the blood, is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so what does it mean to partake of the cup in just a few moments? What does it mean to drink of the blood symbolically here? Here's what it means. It's pointing towards those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. As we outlined earlier that the shedding of blood is needed for the remission of sins. And the only once and for all sacrifice that we have ever seen is this Savior here. And so by taking of the cup symbolically, we are declaring that we are a people who have been made right before God because of the forgiveness of sins that have been offered through the shed blood of Jesus. We are a people of the new covenant now. Not a covenant built upon upholding the law, but a covenant built upon the fulfilled law. So that we can wake up every morning and know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can wake up every morning knowing that his mercies are new as sure as the sun rises. This is the new covenant. It is a covenant that calls us to live in freedom from our sins. It's not a covenant that calls us to walk on eggshells being afraid to sin. But it's a covenant that brings about boldness because of what he has done, about what he has accomplished. So that even if I sit in here now and I'm reflecting upon sins as a believer that I may be stuck in, I am called to see that there is a God who has freed me from said sins. That I have the power and the will now through him to walk away from these sins and to live out the new covenant that is given, that is purchased by Jesus. So the cup symbolizes the shed blood of Jesus that inaugurated, that brought forth the blood that brings about the remission of sins so that we now can be called sons and daughters of God and look forward to the day when all things will be made new and we will eat of the supper again with Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, I praise you for your, spread, for your shed blood, a blood that was spilled so that I may have hope in my hopeless state, that I might see a way out of sin, not of my own accord, not of my own power or intelligence or even willpower, but because of you willingly shedding your blood for me. Jesus, I thank you for the new covenant that doesn't call me to a checklist, but it calls me to a sinless Savior. God, I pray for those in this room who do know you, who are about to partake of the cup. Lord, if there are those who are sitting in sin or sin patterns, that you would remind them of the power of your blood the once and for all sacrifice who has freed us, who has given us the power to walk away from such sins. God, I pray that we would live out this new covenant achieved by you, purchased by you so that we may reflect to a world the hope that is only found in Jesus. Jesus, we lift these things up in your name. Amen.